Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Bigfoot sighting happened in, I think it was 1983. I was deer hunting on a farm with my father. And uh, it had come to the time when my dad said, hey, I'm going to let you hunt by yourself. And of course, to a kid, man, that is, you know, oh man, I finally get to hunt by myself. And so uh, at the time, we ju- I just had a 16 gauge single shot with um, a, uh, you know, buck load inside of it. And uh, so we went to the back of the farm. The farm was about 600 acres. So uh, I was doing a, quite a bit of driving in the truck. And then finally you get to, uh, we had a lake in the middle of the farm. And we had a dam that we made that would, it, it did leak, but it held enough water in it that we did have a little lake. But you would stop at the lake and you would walk around the little lake and go on a logging road. And you would go towards the back. Uh, a lot of guys didn't hunt back there. It was just a heck of a walk, but the deer hunting was good back there. So anyway, my dad took me and he said, here, here's your chance to hunt by yourself. I'm going to be down probably about 50 yards downhill. And uh, I said, all right. So I took my 16 gauge with my deer slug and man, I found me a place to sit where I could watch the top of a uh, ridge. And so I sit there and uh, never saw anything. It just seemed like the deer weren't weren't moving that day. And so uh, about, I said, we got there probably at six. And I'd say about 830 that morning, a tree, you could hear it crack. It came down to my left, probably if I'm looking at the, the ridge, probably about 10 o'clock, it came down and it rolled down the ridge and probably about 70 yards from me. Of course, that will, you know, startle me. And I look up and I see something standing at the top where that tree was. It turned quickly and walked off. I remember seeing this just as clear as yesterday how big this thing was and i thought well whatever that was either pushed that tree as a warning you know hey i don't want you back here or i don't know um you know i told my dad about it you know and he just said it was probably an old tree that you know decided to fall that morning but uh this was a pretty good (laughs) tree that went down and, and came rolling down the hill that was my first encounter. Now, this farm during the summertime was, you know, usually left alone. You know, we came up whenever it came deer season, but I did have an uncle who took a buddy of his and they went scouting probably, I think, beginning of September because bow season here in Tennessee uh, opens up at the end of September. So they were going, you know, just do some scouting. And they came upon what they said was some tracks. And this was in the same area, going past the lake, going to the farthest back in the woods part of the farm. 
And uh, I, it was funny the way they described it is they stopped, they saw these tracks, and they looked at each other, and all they had was a twenty-two, and that was in case they came up on any snakes, uh, because there was rattlesnakes up there, copperheads. And they basically said, whatever this is, this 22 ain't going to kill it. So we better turn around and go back. And so they went back and called and told my dad about it, which, you know, my dad told me about it. And I was just thinking, huh, okay, this kind of makes sense. There's something back here huge. And now there's footprints back here. That deer season. We had a cabin there that we stayed in. It was weird because you could wake up in the middle of the night, or especially early in the morning, like at four or five o'clock. You know, you're getting ready, you're putting your gear on and getting ready to, for the day's hunt, and you could look out, and there would be lights going on the hillside. Now, at first, we thought it was coon hunters. And so, you know, we're thinking, you know, well, there's some guys over there on that ridge that's made their way over to our property line. Of course, a dog can't read, so he's going to go wherever he's, you know, that coon's going. So he, he doesn't know property line. But the speed of these lights, how fast they went, there's no way it could have been dog or human that can move that fast across these mountains and so uh that was something else i remembered about that place uh, it was just a wild country my dad took a bulldozer and made some logging roads up there and that's how we got around very thick up and down terrain when you got a deer Usually, it was going to be a walk to get him and bring him back uh, to where you had a four-wheeler. Or Back then, you had three-wheelers. They didn't have four-wheelers quite yet. So, that was my first encounter. Now, that farm has been sold, and we have a different farm that we hunt. And this farm, we have been hunting probably on 25 years. And uh, nothing out of the ordinary ever happened on this farm up until I say we started hunting there in 95, 96. And 2010, I was going to get ready for turkey season. It was mid March. And I go up to, there's a rock wall that was built by the slaves back many years ago in the Civil War and all that. And so I knew I could put my back up against that wall. And there was some bamboo that I could get in that bamboo and hide and wait for the turkeys to come by and do my turkey call. Well, it was there all these years. But this time when I went up there, every bit of this bamboo had been pulled out of the ground. You had the roots and all showing. And it was all laid. Well, I can't say laid. It was stacked like a teepee, an Indian teepee. And so I thought, well, maybe the, the guys on the back, we had some guys back there that had a farm. And I thought maybe they needed some bamboo for cane poles or something, but I thought surely they would have taken this to pull it up out of the ground, cut it. Yeah. But pulling it all up out of the ground like that, you know, it had to been some work that day to do that and then to leave it. So uh, I took the bamboo and I thought, well, I'm not going to use it now. Even though it was in the shape of a TP, I knew that I didn't make it. I thought, well, maybe someone else is going to hunt here and thinks that they're going to use this as their blind. So I tore it down 
and I uh, got rid of it. Then that summer, it was July of 2010, the cicadas were really bad that year, uh, just noisy here in Tennessee, uh, middle, middle Tennessee. And I remember uh, we had been talking about bush hogging, uh, some of the fields that we deer hunt heavily on, because we usually have to cut them two to three times a year before hunting season. So we thought, well, it is July, but we ain't got anything to do. Let's go up there and bush hog, cut it, and then we'll come back in the middle of August and get it again. And if it still needs to be cut at the end of September, we'll do it again. So we went up there. And my son and a friend of his and my dad, we all went up, we got the tractor going, and we went to the big field, what we call it. And I thought, well, it's hot. My dad's elderly. I'll start off cut. And I told the kids, you know, where are you going? And they said, well, my son wanted to show his friend the pond. I said, okay. So they went to look at the pond they were going to look for some deer tracks and just see what they you know they could see uh they were both probably i think 14 years old so i get on the tractor they go walking uh, up the logging road to where they're they're going to go look at the pond and i made probably a almost a full lap around this field this field is probably biggest three football fields i made a a lap and as I was coming back up to finish the first lap on this field, I see the kids running at full speed down the middle of the field on the strip that I'd already cut and heading my way. And so I'm thinking, what in the world they had, you know, I knew they had just, you know, had time probably to get almost to the pond. So they come running and uh I shut the tractor off and I said, what's going on? You know, y'all didn't stay long. And they were out of breath and they looked at me and they said, you know, my son said, dad, big, real big. And I'm like, big. Well, what I said, you see a big buck? I said, we got a big buck running the farm. And he said, no, dad, no, 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 no. This this real big, you know, they call him uh, and she spoke up and she said, Bigfoot. And I said, Bigfoot? And she said, yeah. And he looked at me. He said, Dad, there was nothing that you could do. He said, it's so big. He said, I mean, you know, he's in so much excitement and I guess fear. He said that he could see the muscles under the fur of this animal, just huge. The girth, he said it was unbelievable. He said, Dad, it could have caught us. I know it could have caught us. And I said, how you figure? He said, well, I was walking and I'm looking for deer tracks. She's walking ahead of me. And all of a sudden she's coming back and she says, turn around and go back. She said, something's back there. And he says, what are you talking about? He said, the pond's right here. She said, turn around and go back. And he said, Okay, so he turns around, and they're both walking back towards the field where I'm at. When he stops to see, he just said, let me see what she's talking about. He turns around, and this thing is standing in the middle of the logging road. What she tells me, as she is walking, and she's in front of him, she saw something look out from behind a tree. And she said she turned and, well, she stopped and she looked, you know, like, what is that? And she said it looked from behind a tree again and peeked and she got to see how tall it was and that it was hairy. It had a lot of hair. And she turned around. She knew that, you know, it shouldn't have been there. So... She's going back, you know, and tells him to, you know, turn around, go back. There's something back here that is just go. 
And he starts, you know, taking about three or four steps. And he looks back. And this thing went from that tree out to the middle of the logging road, which was probably two for humans. I'd say it would take about probably 15 steps. He said to make it that fast to go from there to there. And he said, we are walking back towards the field. And he said, I look back, Dad, and he said, it's already about 10, 15 yards. He said, that's when I saw what he said it looked like. It, it's, its jaw was either broken or it had either it was showing its teeth, but it looked like a puzzled look uh, or it was chewing something. It did not look mean. He said it didn't look like it was growling at us, but as it was looking like uh, puzzled, looked like, what are you doing here now? You know, we're never up there during the summertime. Now, I need to say this on both sides of our farm that day, they were bush hogging. So you've got a farm on the left and a farm on the right that was bush hogging. Whether that pushed this thing out onto our farm, maybe it was trying to get from one farm to the other to get into some thick cover, I don't know. But he said for it to move that fast, that quick, and to be up on them, he said, Dad, I just said, run. And they took off. He said, I'm sure it could have caught us. No problem. He said, he just did not feel that it was going to harm them, but leave. So they got to me, told me what was going on. I told my dad, you know, and he's like, boy, we've been hunting here for a long time. We've never. And I started telling him, I said, dad, wait a minute. We got to talk about this because some things have happened, you know, and he's like, what are you talking about? I said, we'll talk later. So. Me and the kids, we get in my truck. He gets on the, the tractor, starts bush hogging. I drive to where they saw it. And she said it was standing behind that tree right there. I shut the truck off. I get out. Of course, it's July. It's hot. There's no mud. There's no way I could find any imprints because July, it's hot. It's not raining much here. But everything was quiet, eerily quiet. The cicadas were not, you know, doing their thing. You didn't hear any birds. It was just so eerily quiet. And so I just told him, I said, yeah, let's get back in the truck. And, you know, whatever it was, it's gone. So we finished bush, bush hogging. And, of course, they stayed at the truck. They wouldn't go anywhere any, anymore. And uh, we finished it up. And as we're going back, they're both of them are quiet. My son and, and his friend, they're not really saying nothing. They're just, I think they're in shock. So we get back and uh, we take the friend home. My son comes home with me. My dad, I drop him off at his house. And so I got to the house and I pull, I mean, we pulled in the, in the driveway and I said, son, I said, I know that you don't lie to your dad. And I said, did this really happen? And he said, Daddy, I'm going to stack a Bible. He said, this happened, Dad. He goes, I've never seen anything this big. I've never seen anything this big. And he said, I'm not going to hunt by myself this year. At least I'm not going to my deer stand in the dark. He said, I would rather you take me to my deer stand and put me, you know, make sure I get there and put me up up there and come back. And I thought, boy, it's, 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 this thing has really put fear in you. You're not even going to go to your own deer stand without me taking you. So I got to talking to my dad and I said, dad, you know, the last year, every time we field dressed a deer, we would field dress the deer at a certain spot that the landowner had told us, which is right next to a pond. 
and we would field dress it and we would just drive up to the house and tell, you know, the guy, hey, we got one. You know, you want to come on out here? He's a good buck or it's a, you know, it's a good sized doe. And he would come out and we he'd look at it, you know, and that would be it. We'd turn around and go back and everything, stomach, the liver, heart, gone. Now, this was probably within a 10 minute time. So I'm looking up in the trees and I'm like, there's no buzzards. The coyote would still be trying to chew on this, probably be a couple of them. And I'm like, well, there's no blood where it drug it. And it just blew my mind. And it happened, I know, two times that year that, you know, we were just thinking, man, there's got to be the, you know, some fast coyotes around here or, you know, that was to clean up two of our deer gut pile that quick. It was unbelievable. We never did think, you know, hey, I'm going to stay back, you know, and just see what's cleaning this up so quick. You know, we were all just wanting to go up there and, and uh, the landowner lived by himself. And we he enjoyed when hunting season came because he knew we would be up there and he would have company. He was never married. The house was built in 1890, and uh, the Confederate soldiers used to stay on the property, and they would wash their clothes in the ponds that were up there. And uh, it had a lot of history on that farm. Okay, that year we got through everything with nothing happening. We changed where we would field dress our deer at. Uh, we took it to an open field, and there was a tree in the middle of that field with some bushes, and we would field dress our deer there. So I'm thinking, okay, if there's anything getting this, we're going to be able to see it, <laughs> or by the time we get back, it's still going to be trying to drag it. And it, nothing ever touched it up until this year when we field dress something there. It's never touched. We have not gone back, you know, and I'll tell you what happened about three years after that, probably 2013, 2014, my son was getting ready for turkey season. All was good. He was hunting by himself again. You know, he just said, hey, it had to be something you know, that, that was passing through. Uh, we even talked to uh, a lady from BFR. Oh, who uh, came and walked the farm. They drew, they, they set both of the kids down separately, interviewed them, did, they had to do, I think it was six different drawings until the kids said, that's it. Both of them agreed on. But anyway, three years after all this, my son decides he's going to sit up and a turkey blind up where we used to field dress the deer. We hardly ever hunt around that area because it's not very far from where our camp is, where our trailer is that we bring up there to stay in. We just think, you know, with us making noise at night and in the morning with the generator running, there's not going to be any deer around there. You know, they're going to be spooked. They could hear us. But he said, hey, I'm going to go over and build a, a turkey blind back in here. What he came across is something similar to what I had with the bamboo, but this was cedars that had all been bunched together, the tops of them pushed together, and you could see where something was sitting there. Where it was sitting, it could plainly see when we would come, when we would go, and when we would field dress our deer right there at that old spot. I think it would probably been 40 yards, maybe 35. So this thing could have waited till we gone, you know, we left, got up, 
went over there, grabbed what he could, came back, and we would have never known it. And it just must knew that's where food was. After him finding the structure, we started hunting more around there, which we never saw anything anymore. No out of ordinary things happened until 20, 2018. My son was turkey hunting around back of the farm. And uh, this, where you get to the back, you've got to drive down uh, a pretty good ways down a road that basically parallels the farm. And it's a paved road. And you drive all the way down. And when you get to the back of the farm, there's a gate. And there's cattle back there. Well, <laughs> we couldn't put up artificial turkey blinds. We used to take the burlap bags and put them up because the cattle would just tear them down. You know, they were nosy. You know, usually cows are. They want to know, hey, what the, what's this that you got over here? What's this you got over here? So every time we would build a blind, you come back and it was tore down and you could see where they had walked through it. So a week before turkey season, him and uh, his girlfriend, my son and his girlfriend go up and he's going to put up a little blind, a uh, store-bought blind. And he said, you know, if they tear this up, it's it's not nothing I've spent a lot of money on. He said, I'm going to put it there and hopefully it'll last one week and they don't tear it up. So they went up there and he set his blind up and uh, tried to camouflage it. And after they went back there and did that, they come to where the gate is and he gets out and goes to unlock the gate so they can go back you know, on the road and go home. As he unlocks the gate, his girlfriend, who knows nothing about our encounters, she doesn't know anything about it. She said when he got back from unlocking the gate, she said, Casey, you ever uh, heard of those, uh, you know, the great big things they call them, Sasquatch, Bigfoot? And right then, Casey just says, what are you talking about? You know, And he knows what she's talking about, but he doesn't want you know to scare her by telling her that, yeah, we've seen them. And he said, why? Why would bring that up? She said, when you got out and you went and unlocked the gate, over here to the left, over there in the fence row, this thing stood up. And she said, it was huge. It looked at you, it looked at me in the truck, and it started walking off. And she said, I look, and I'm thinking, I'm seeing what they call Bigfoot Sasquatch. And he said, are you sure what you saw? And she said, Casey, I wouldn't say this, you know, if, you know, I didn't. And he said, so you saw it? And she said, yeah, what you mean? And he said, we do have one or maybe more that I think come through here seasonally. They know when we deer hunt. I think they don't hang around when we're hunting because we never, we've never felt threatened. We've never seen one. And so she said, well, look, I just know it went that away. And if you want to go look for it, go ahead. But it's too big for me to mess with. And I'm not going. And he said, no, no, I don't I don't want to go. So they left. That same year, bow season, 2018, opening weekend. It was end of September. I didn't hunt. My son and a friend of his, they went hunting. And he pointed to his a place that his son could walk down the field, take a right, and there'd be a deer stand. He told him, so I'm going to be at the other end of this field, about 40 yards off of it, in another deer stand. Now, these deer come through this field constant, so we should be able to get a shot. Okay. His friend goes down, gets in one of the stands. Casey gets probably about halfway to his stand. And up on the hill, 
something lets out a scream. And way that his friend said it was so close enough he could feel it in his chest. It was powerful. Casey heard it and he stopped. And immediately his friend come on their walkie talkie and said, did you just hear that? And he said, yes. He said, what was it? He said, I don't know. He said, I've, I haven't heard anything like that ever scream like that, that loud. And he said, all I know is I'm picking up my steps, going much faster to get to my deer stand. So he went and got to his uh, deer stand, and they did not see anything that day. He said, Dad, it was like that farm was dead. There was no deer, no turkeys. There was hardly any squirrels out. He said, we hunted until almost 11 o'clock and did not see anything. It was just eerily quiet on the farm after that scream. So the rest of the year, nothing seemed to you know, happen. The following year, 2019, during muzzleloader season, I've been hunting that afternoon, and I seen a really nice buck, and I knew I couldn't get a shot from the stand, so I got down, and I walked the ways to where I could get up on this hump, and I sat down, and on, well, I went down on one knee to take a shot, and uh, I shot at this buck, and he took off running, and I thought, well, either I missed or he's heading down to my son, which is down at the other end of this field. So I immediately hit the walkie-talkie and said, hey, you got one coming to you? I don't think I hit him because he is running full speed down your way. Within a minute, his gun goes off. I'd say maybe 20 seconds. His gun goes off, and he tells me, I got him. And I said, you got him? He said, I got him. I got me a good buck. I said, Great. So we go down there and we got the deer and my dad comes over and man, I mean, it's a really nice buck. So we're sitting there talking and I'm congratulating my son. And, and, uh, I said, I'll tell you what, you drag him over here. I'm going to go get the truck and I'll come down and get it. So I, I walk up the same field up that same logging road that they had their first sighting. When I got to that logging road, when I stepped out of the field and I started on that logging road for the first time ever, I smelt something that smelt horrid. I mean, it smelt like garbage, along with maybe, I don't want to say sulfur. It just smelt like rock, something really horrible. And so I started walking and I got this feeling that came over me. And I've never had this up there. Don't look left. Don't look right. Keep going. And I kept walking and I thought, gosh, what is that smell? Could it be a coyotes? They stink. And I'm thinking, maybe it's a coyote. And I, and it, I just felt, don't look right. Don't look left. Just keep walking to your truck. And so I just kept walking. The more I wanted to look, the more I felt don't. And so I went, I got in the truck, started it up. I did not look. I went straight into the field with my truck down there and got the deer. And I told when I got back, I said, guys, I said, there was something that when I went and got this truck, that smelled really bad. I mean, I, I said, you know, did, do you know if any of the guys have shot a coyote and left it laying or have you noticed anything? And I was like, no, we hunt this field all the time. Never smelt anything like nasty. Or, I said, well, there was something when I went to get the truck. And I said, I had sort of a fear come over me is not to look to the right and not look to the left. And I said, all I was con concentrating on is get from point A to point B, get the truck, go get your deer, and get out of there. And that was the last 
time that we've ever had anything happen. My son, he hunts up there a lot now. And every time I'll even ask him, you see anything? Nope. You see anything? No. And uh, now the property next to us, a man has bought it and has put an airplane hangar there. And he's doing a lot of construction over there. So I don't think it's going to be hanging around anything where an airplane is flying in and out. Obviously, the guy's got a lot of money. And on the other side of us, they keep it up kept now. They cut the fields regular. They use the hay off of it. So there's not many places for something to hide. I mean, the deer do have places that they can go. But something big, I just, I don't see it staying over there. So as of now, 2021, 2022, we have not had any more encounters. There was a man that had some footprints during 2020-19 January snow. It only snowed two days that year, and it was in January, and it was on a Saturday and Sunday. Saturday it snowed. Sunday morning it was still snowing, but he went out to his, and and this farm is only about five miles from our farm. And he said when he went out, he looked and seen these tracks, and he's like, what in the world? has been walking across my front yard. And he said, it looked like there was two adults and a juvenile. Two of the, or or four, you know, you had two sets of footprints that were big and you had a small set that probably was probably a size 14. The other ones, you know, were 17, 18, you know, just big. And he said, it looked like the two Adults went around one side of his house and the juvenile went towards the barn and then they all met back up and they went on towards the back of his farm. He was uh, smart enough to lay down a $20 bill and get some pictures. I do have those pictures as well and just show how big these footprints were. That's the only time that we've, at least my, uh, acknowledge that there's been any more sightings or tracks found on this our place so that's my story and i'm glad i was able to share it with you guys and that's all i got my bigfoot sightings are as follows i was a lead criminal investigator with the pennsylvania state police And I uh, used to go out to my creek in the evenings when I'd arrive home from work around two to three in the morning. I would start a bonfire near my creek and uh, I was under a lot of stress. I just did it to relax. I would go over to the creek, start my fire, and I experienced several different occurrences that happened to me while I was doing so. The one evening, I just knew for about a month that somebody was watching me. Based upon my experience as a police officer, I was always aware of this. I had a sixth sense, and I would always carry a bright LED flashlight 735 looms, I believe it was. And I would also always have my handgun. And I would start the fire and just relax for a half hour or so. I could feel this something watching me. So the one evening when I proceeded over, I walked down my path and I observed something in a tree area near my residence and it was adjacent to where i would walk my path i flashed my flashlight upon the object 
I observed red eyes looking at me in a group of trees that I had. And then that object moved around to the side. It took position behind a tree and it did the typical bob and weave move. This being was about eight and a half foot tall. By holding my light upon it, I could regulate its size and I mentally marked the spot in the tree where a branch came out and the it equaled about his height. I later measured that, and it was eight to eight and a half foot tall. I stood there gazing at him in amazement. He would bob and weave around the tree. It was a very large, hairy animal. I'm going to say probably five to 800 pounds, and we had eye contact. The eyes were humongous. They were very large and red, and they were about 9 to 12 inches apart. I could see his facial features. I saw a long, hairy coat on this being, and at first I was threatened. I, being the nature of me, pulled out my firearm and held it down to my side but I did not feel threatened. In the beginning, I was threatened. But after a few minutes, I did not, I felt like peaceful because I felt like he was there to send me a message. And I'm a strong believer in Sasquatches not revealing themselves to any person that does not believe in them or that they don't want to reveal themselves to. I really believe that my Sasquatch is a type of protector for me. I have had another encounter about five miles away from my residence where I currently live, and I had the same basic experience. It did not last for 15 minutes, like the first encounter did. We were standing face to face, going back to that encounter, 15 yards apart when I initially saw him. And then he moved around the group of trees so that he was 20, about 20 yards away from me. And it was just an eye opening experience. I can't say I really believed in Sasquatches in the beginning, but after this encounter, it was a life-changing experience. And about two months ago, my wife was taking care of our horses, and she came home, and she had that look on her face like she experienced something. And she told me that she heard vocalizations, and it was just I could tell that she had an experience. She didn't actually see the creature, but she did have that glance of amazement upon her face. I should also notice, note that we had several experiences where I would hear tree knocking in the area, which again is typical for the Sasquatches to communicate with themselves and others. Thank you. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the bomb and rose where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah